Listener Production. Hello, welcome to The Briefing. I'm Sasha Barbagat. For a long time, China has been viewed as an economic powerhouse on the world stage. But that's all starting to shift. The Chinese economy has started to slow. Its population started to age. And of course, you also had that trade war when Donald Trump was president of the United States, which impacted economic growth. So what's going on with the Chinese economy and how does it impact us here in Australia? That's coming up in the second half of this episode. First, though, let's get into the headlines with Chris Spiru on Tuesday, October 15. Morning, Sash. Morning, everybody. We start this morning with a big windfall our wallets. So the federal government has announced plans to ban debit card surcharges for shoppers. That means whenever you tap or insert your card, whether it's buying your morning coffee or a new pair of shoes, you won't be slugged that extra one, two or 5% by the retailer. The change won't come into effect until January 1 of 2026, though, and is subject to a review by the Reserve Bank, Sash. Yeah, Labor is also asking the consumer watchdog, the ACCC, to investigate excessive card costs charged by some businesses. Uh, we were talking before we hit record about, what was it, your local fish and chip shop that slugs you 5%? I am not naming and shaming, Dodgy Sasha. operators, I think you called them. <laughs> no, I did not. Um, so there are plenty of people doing the wrong thing out there. Yeah. Uh, it is estimated we're losing anywhere between $1 and $4 billion a year to these debit card surcharges. So definitely a win for the hip pocket. And it's interesting because I think when card payments first came into force, you know, retailers would say and small businesses would say, oh, you know, it takes us ages to get the Mm. money from the bank. They take ages to release the funds. We have to pay extra money in order to process these. So hence, we're charging you a surcharge if you want to use your card. Uh, But bank fees are way lower these days. It definitely doesn't take as long for that money to be released. So the argument is kind of null and void. Hence, Labor saying, all right, It's time Mm. to end this practice. And just 12% of purchases in Australia are made in cash these days anyway. Most people using their card, which means we are all, majority of us, are paying this extra money, which probably doesn't really need to be paid. Uh, And it's worth noting as well, a ban would bring Australia's practice in line with the UK and other parts of Europe where you don't get charged a surcharge. So RBA is still looking into it, but Labor has made it pretty clear that they want to push ahead with this change. Sticking with politics, Palestinian refugees in Australia must now be personally invited to apply for a longer visa. The conversation around temporary humanitarian visas flared late last week as Labor and the Coalition faced off in Parliament over security screenings. Now, though, the Albanese government says it won't be offering automatic visas to Gazan refugees living in Australia, which is estimated to be about 1,500 people at the moment. Instead, they've opened an online form which will allow them to express their interest in staying in the country, Sash. Immigration Minister Tony Burke will then be personally responsible for overseeing applications and then inviting people based on those applications to apply for a three-year visa. So the plans have been criticised as less generous when you compare it to the coalition's treatment of Ukrainian refugees who were all offered three-year humanitarian visas by the former immigration minister. However, the Palestine-Australia release and Action Group has welcomed the government's humanitarian pathway, but has said that a route to permanency is essential. Yeah, and just moving to the Middle East now for a moment, at least 21 people have been killed after Israel struck Lebanon's north for the first time early this morning, while millions of Israelis have taken shelter from projectiles fired back across the border. Israeli PM Benjamin Netanyahu has vowed to mercilessly strike Hezbollah, after its drone attack on a military base in Israel killed four Israeli soldiers. Earlier in the day, we saw at least 14 people killed and dozens injured when Israel struck a food distribution centre in Gaza, as well as the courtyard of a hospital tent camp where displaced Palestinians had been seeking shelter. And there were some really confronting videos shared to social media by journalist Sash, which showed people at the hospital being burnt alive as rescuers struggled to contain the fire. An IDF spokesperson has said that the Air Force carried out an attack on a command and control centre used by Hamas. Aussies could soon be able to join a class action against Ticketmaster and Live Nation over allegations of dodgy ticketing practices. So this comes after an ABC investigation uncovered claims they were charging fans hidden fees for concert tickets and, on top of that, questions about the decision to bring in dynamic pricing. So that's when the cost of a ticket to a gig goes up as it gets more popular, kind of like surge pricing 
for Ubers. If you want more of an explanation, mm. uh, we did a great explainer on this last Wednesday, October 9. Go check it out. Yeah, in Australia, the model has been used for tickets to Green Day, the Australian Open and the Grand Prix. One lawyer says his firm has been contacted by multiple people concerned about the practices of Live Nation and Ticketmaster when it comes to selling these tickets to major events and that they're investigating whether or not to proceed with legal action. Mm. It's a big day for tickets in Australia as mm. well. The Oasis general sales starts today. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Shout out to uh, all the middle-aged men who uh, they are treating this like the year is to us. Especially like, the middle-aged men who work on this show, Sasha. Yeah, shout out to Cuz. He got his tickets <laughs> yesterday. Cuz uh, makes everything sound beautiful when you listen to it. So we're very happy for Cuz that his, uh, his the, you know, the gladiator fight to get tickets to Oasis yeah. is over for him. He succeeded yesterday in the pre-sale. Yeah. There were complaints, though, that the tickets up yesterday were super expensive. Mm. And I did chat to Cuz to get confirmation. Mm-hmm. And he said, yeah, they were sitting at about three. $305 for rear standing tickets. Um, but also happening today is uh, the laneway pre-sale. Mm-hmm. We also talked about this last week because Charlie XEX is headlining yeah. and uh, she is a major draw card and I know lots of people in the office today who are trying to get tickets to that. So I do feel like there's this, um, the way we approach getting tickets to concerts has really changed, I feel, mm-hmm. since Taylor Swift, since like, you know, it was like a cultural movement almost. Yeah. And I think we're just seeing that continue. It's kind of fun to watch from the sidelines. But yeah, there's some really serious allegations against Ticketmaster and Live Nation. Allegations, of course, not proven. Um, but yeah, whether whether this lawsuit goes ahead will be interesting. And Donald Trump has gone on a 1am rant against a new biopic about him called The Apprentice. I'm sorry, you're fired. Get out of here. Before we get to his comments, here's a little snippet from the official trailer. You have a big ass. You gotta work on that. Your face looks like an orange. Attack, attack, attack. Deny everything, admit nothing. Never admit defeat. What if you lost your fortune today? Well, then maybe I'll run for president. I don't know. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah, it's definitely not a flattering portrait of his rise to real estate supremacy in New York throughout the 70s, 80s and 90s. And the former president has responded as such, describing the movie as, quote, a cheap, defamatory and politically disgusting hatchet job. He's also questioned the timing of The Apprentice's release, which is on the eve of the November election, saying it's meant to thwart his presidential bid. And the film also contains some really confronting scenes, one in which Trump's character appears to sexually assault his first wife, Ivana. And I think that's really important for viewers to know ahead of maybe going to the cinemas and watching this. There's also, of course, a whole heap of silly stuff too, with his character taking amphetamines, having liposuction and getting a hair transplant sash. I'm going to side with the former president here for a second. You can't deny that the timing of the release is pretty interesting. Oh, very convenient. Americans are preparing to head to the polls. There's like, I don't know, 20 days to go. It's November 5, right? It's just a couple of weeks away. And this movie is coming out about him that definitely does not paint him in a positive light. Um, It definitely gave me Wolf of Wall Street meets Succession vibes. Maybe that's because Jeremy Strong is in it, who is one of the main characters. Shout out to uh, Kendall Roy. Um, Maybe that's why I got that feeling. But yeah, I think it's really playing on that that genre and what people are kind of into at the moment. Yeah, and I will say that these films do, while they might not be entirely truthful, they do carry the ability to change perceptions of oh, a yeah. person. So, like, I felt that way after watching Elvis, the Baz Luhrmann mm-hmm. version. I was kind of like, I learned things about Elvis that I didn't know, and I was a bit like, oh, Yeah, but I think that's the, honestly, that's the case with a lot of people who have been around for a while because times were very different mm. 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> what flew then wouldn't fly now in no. a lot of cases. So this film did debut um, at Cannes to very positive reviews, but there's a lot of controversy around it as well. Hollywood didn't want to fund it. Actors who were involved in the project didn't want to humanise oh. Trump, which is really interesting. Uh, and investors nearly pulled support for it after seeing it. But it's it's debuting, it's, it's going out there and... Donald Trump isn't happy about it. Surprise, surprise. All right. Thanks, Chris, for joining us for the headlines today. Next up, we're getting into our deep dive, looking at China's economy. There's some really interesting tidbits in that story about why it's having all these problems. So worth a listen and worth finding out just how a weak China economy affects us. The Chinese economy has become vital to the well-being of our own here in Australia. For years, decades even, the story out of China has been one of astounding economic success and growth. 
But has overspending, overconsuming, and bad investment finally caught up with Beijing? Late last month, apparently spooked by faltering growth, the Chinese government adopted an array of economic stimulus measures designed to reset the economy. So just how bad is the situation over there? And should we be looking elsewhere for trade partners right now? Joining me to talk about it is the lead economist for impact economics and policy, Dr. Angela Jackson. Doctor, welcome to the briefing today. Look, Let's start with the very top line. We're hearing these reports that China's economy is slowing down. Is that true? And what is driving that trend? It certainly is true. I think, um, you know, we've all grown up during a period where the Chinese economy really has just kept going from strength to strength. You know, it used to record uh, economic growth with a sort of 9%, which is very, very high. And we've seen it industrialise over the last 20 to 30 years. And that growth has been really important for Australia. Really, what we've seen is since sort of the end of the last decade coming into the pandemic, the Chinese economy has started to slow. Its population started to age. Issues have started to emerge in its um, residential property market in particular. And of course, you also had that trade war when Donald Trump was president of the United States, which impacted economic growth. And so we've really seen a slowdown in Chinese economic growth. Now, it's still pretty strong um, in terms of if, you know, if, if Australia was recording sort of four or five percent economic growth a year, we'd be really, really happy. But for an economy like China, uh, it's much slower than it was. How is this impacting people in China? As you said, it's still strong. It's not like the country has gone into recession or is going backwards, I suppose. But are we seeing a real translation of this slowing economy impacting the people of China? Yeah, so what we're seeing is certainly rising youth unemployment, which is a concern. Um, It's up now heading towards around 20%. Again, not something that would be that uncommon here in Australia, but certainly for China, um, a significant problem. Um, And then, of course, it means that whereas people were really progressing, where there are opportunities for people to lift their living standards, and we'd seen, you know, that strong economic growth in China really lift people out of poverty, that transition's just not happening at the same rate. And what that means for people in China is, yes, there's undoubtedly people still doing well in China um, and uh, large portions of them are are doing well. But particularly for those that are still living in relative poverty uh, in rural areas of China, it means those opportunities uh, for progression really are diminishing. Now, that has broader implications politically in China. Obviously, we're talking about the second biggest economy in the world, but we're also talking about a country that isn't a democracy and the the chances and the, the prognosis in terms of political upheaval as well are, are real um, and could have even you know more dire consequences going forward for the Chinese population. It looks like China's trying to shift from this kind of export-led economy, you know, selling goods to other countries, to more of a consumption-driven economy, so spending by its own citizens. What does that mean for countries like Australia that rely on China for demand for resources? Australia has really benefited particularly from the industrialisation phase of China's development. Um, Obviously, that's involved building a lot of things, um, which has required a lot of iron ore from Australia, and and we've earned a lot of money from that. And China has been, you know, critically important in terms of our economic growth. You know, it counts around 7% of our gross domestic product every year. That's a all our economic output um, and has contributed around 30% of to economic growth over the last couple of decades. So been really, really important. For China to move from where it is and what we think about China now is it's now it's gone from a very low income country to a middle income country. And what it needs to do to keep growing is become what we'd say is a highly advanced or an advanced economy like Australia, like the US. That transition is really hard um, and it does involve uh, economies relying more on consumers, but that requires a lot of confidence from consumers and uh, information that consumers need to have and that businesses themselves, that internal generation of economic growth, you know, I can invest here because I have confidence. It's a really hard thing for China to do uh, at this point of its development when it's not a democracy in particular. And so it's kind of reached this point where its economic growth, it needs to become driven internally, but it's struggling to do that. And the government's trying to encourage it. 
it's going to struggle. I think it's going to have some real problems over uh, the next five to 10 years as it, yes, tries to prop up demand with fiscal stimulus, but ultimately consumers have to have confidence to do that. And it's difficult to have that confidence when you're not in a democracy the way that we are here in Australia, where we can rely on things like this podcast to give us information about what's happening. Uh, the people in China don't have that and it's really undermining and, and undermining their economic growth and the prospects for that to continue into the future. Mm, yeah, that's such an interesting point and I hadn't uh, thought of it from that angle before. I'm interested as well, there have been reports in the last few months, especially around real estate in China and how that is kind of in its own crisis. Is there a potential that we'll see flow on effects to Australia from that in that, you know, there's reports of people, citizens not feeling comfortable or uh, confident, which you've mentioned already, in purchasing property from Chinese developers? Could we see that then flow on where they're going, well, maybe I'll invest overseas? Potentially, although there's limits around how much people can invest in the Australian market. And, you know, there are certainly cases of that occurring, but it's pretty minor in terms of uh, the ability of people to invest in the Australian residential property market if you're not a resident here in the country. But yes, what we've seen, and, and going back to my point, particularly in the property market in China, is it's been an area where there's been a lot of investment um, by consumers and by households in the property sector. Um, and it's accounted for a significant and a higher than normal percentage of the Chinese economy over time. So that's kind of a positive. But what you've seen is, you know, you've seen these pictures of ghost cities. So people have invested in things that have gone south pretty badly um, and people have lost a lot of money. Um, there's been an overinvestment probably in the sector. And again, it comes down to confidence and the ability to trust the system if you like. Um, and so if you can't trust the information you're getting and you're not sure whether or not it's a, a good investment or not, uh, it really undermines confidence and that undermines economic growth. It's hard to understand, I think, in Australia where we get information, where we can talk freely about things, about how important that is to the economy and how important that is to people being able to make decisions and to economic growth. But economies basically run off information and uh, and where I think China and, and its residential property market is a case in point suffers from is that crisis of confidence that comes from not being able to have faith in the information you're getting. For example, there are laws in China that say you can't talk down the economy. Now, you need to be able to say, look, that was a bad investment. This isn't going well for investors and for households to have confidence to invest. And so we've seen people really pull back significantly in uh, property in China, uh, and that is going to hurt their economy because it's such an important part of uh, economic growth, particularly, you know, we see that here in Australia as well, you know, the importance of the property market in terms of our economy and how it operates. I'm curious, is there any signal or, you know, could the Chinese government potentially shift its stance on the way that it allows information to be communicated, given that it's having such an impact on the economy? Yeah. And again, this is where I think, and not to be too negative, because I think it's easy to get negative, you know, the China growth story is a remarkable one. You know, it has seen, you know, literally hundreds of millions of people lifted out of poverty in the last 20 to 30 years, and it's fueled global economic growth. But economies get to this point, and we've seen this in, in the past with countries like South Korea, like Taiwan, where if they have a choice in essence, where they can either democratise and they keep growing, like we've seen in those countries, or they go off a path, and I don't want to use Zimbabwe here, but a country like Zimbabwe was a similar, you know, it had a lot of growth, it was going really well. It didn't have a democratic system, it didn't democratise, and it goes into failed state territory. China is becoming not more open, it's becoming more closed. And so politically, it's in a very difficult position where it needs to, I guess, grapple with that need to reform its systems to open up, to democratise if it's going to continue uh, on this path of economic growth. At the moment, it doesn't seem to be taking that path. That doesn't mean it won't be important to our economy. It will continue to be important, but it won't necessarily be this source, I don't think, of economic growth as it has been in the past. We're going to have to look elsewhere uh, for that economic growth going forward. Mm, and that kind of ties into my next question, which was, you know, how important is the economic health of China in relation to Australia's own economy and our own economic health? 
Uh, look, it's critically important. Well, it has been critically important for the last generation. And again, I think for people listening to this podcast today, you can't remember a time when China wasn't growing and it wasn't a really important source of economic growth for Australia. You know, it accounts for around 30% of our economic growth. That's a lot uh, in, in terms of one country's contribution to the overall health of the Australian economy. So, For us, it is going to be a big deal if China continues to slow and can't grapple with these challenges. And certainly I think, you know, we're going to have to think about, well, where is this growth going to come from then? Um, And, you know, there's certainly a lot of ideas out there that maybe India is going to be the next source of economic growth and a country that we should be looking to have closer ties with. It's certainly not the end of the road for China, as I said, but I think the the idea that it can continue to grow as it has uh, without those reforms, which are looking relatively unlikely at the moment, we shouldn't fool ourselves into thinking that you know China is going to continue to provide uh, that level of support to our economy. Mm. Uh, Dr. Angela Jackson, thanks so much for your time today. Uh, an interesting discussion. It's complicated, but you know we really do at this point, as you said, rely on China in a lot of ways for our own economy and economic health. So uh, it's important to know what's happening there. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. That was Dr. Angela Jackson from Impact Economics and Policy speaking with me there. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of The Briefing. That is it for now. Before you go, we would love it if you could share this ep with someone you think might enjoy it. And if you want to keep up with our other content, don't forget we put up full episodes of The Weekend Briefing on YouTube. Search Listener Newsroom and don't forget to subscribe. We're also on Instagram at The Briefing Podcast and TikTok at Listener Newsroom. And we'll be back in your feed with another ep this afternoon from 3. I'm Sasha Barbagat. See you next time. Listener.